A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be a bit of undigested beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. <laughs> Why, there's more of gravy than of grave about you. Whatever you are. Humbug, I tell you. Humbug. Freeze program. Hello and welcome to Ear Read This. My name's Ash, and today, why today, I'm talking about A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Long-time listeners to the podcast will remember Adam and I had a doomed attempt at doing this last year, and uh, this time round it took us three run-ups, as we were haunted by various audio phantoms. Um, We had roadworks that were setting up just next to Adam's head. I um, forgot to hit record, and Adam didn't forget to hit his mic. Um, several times, but we got there in the end. Uh, So without further ado, let's get into A Christmas Carol. Adam and I started our conversation a week or so ago, uh, before Christmas Day, and um, began in a true Scrooge-like manner, comparing the previous Christmas to the Christmas of 2020. So it has been a year since we last tried to record this. Ash, Ash is acting like we didn't just have a failed attempt to record this intro (laughs) minutes before and then a failed attempt the other night. The point we're getting across is that every time we try to talk about the Christmas Carol, it's just something goes wrong. Yeah. We have mentioned back in whenever it was March, uh, Don Quixote. Yeah. We were in the pub, weren't we? We were in our nice recording. What's, what's the pub? I don't know. I don't know what that is. Um, although it was pretty COVID even beforehand because we were just in the basement of the pub. But any- anyway, that was the episode where we confessed what had happened because I think we'd talked about doing Christmas Carol and we said we tried, we got drunk. The episode was a roaring success uh, live, but um, <laughs> the recording was Sounded absolutely ruined awful. for some reason, yeah. which I was just saying is the worst thing to have happened in the past 12 months. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I, th- I think I would. I think this is definitely the worst thing to happen in 2019 or 2020 is the loss of our Christmas Carol podcast. One day when when both of us are long gone, they'll find it in in your archives (laughs) as the great piece of lost work and it'll be restored and remastered and released. You're absolutely no fanfare whatsoever. Yeah. So we were just saying, compared to those halcyon days um, of festivity and merriment, this this Christmas is looking pretty pretty grim all around. Yeah, I um a lot of our listeners I think aren't from the UK mm. and may not know what's happening here right now, but they've decided that six days before Christmas is a good time to tell people not to travel home for Christmas, mm. which has led to the beaching of a lot of plans. A lot of people left adrift, and me and Ash are squarely in that category, and we were thinking about what depressing meals for one we could possibly have for (laughs) christmas dinner i mean i'd already decided not to go because it just wasn't worth the risk yeah but um yeah we're gonna be christmasing alone very much very much like like ebenezer scrooge ebenezer scrooge but maybe we'll have three pleasant visitors who will who will uh transport us back to um last christmas and tell us remember to plug that in otherwise the recording won't work take me to christmas past and leave me there please yeah yeah um so go on what's on the short list for a christmas meal oh don't don't make me do this i've not even thought i haven't either i was thinking of trying to order a curry i i have no idea um i think is that working curry's operational uh i know that um chinese takeaways are famously open on christmas day Mm. So I may may end up being a Chinese. If not, I may make myself a little little nut roast, which is normally what me and my parents have for a vegetarian Christmas. So, were you vegetarian? I was I was brought up vegetarian, and then I went back to meat, okay. and now I'm kind of off it again. So, oh, it's a nice nice Christmas comfort meal, not too hard. Mm. But honestly, it's just the actual cooking for I love cooking, and I don't mind cooking for one. But there's just something about doing it on Christmas Day, which. <gasps> I don't like the thought of. I think I think the way we have to approach this is this isn't. It's not really Christmas, you know. Shall we order each other a takeaway? Absolutely, absolutely not. You will get me something 
awful. I know you will. <laughs> well, obviously meat. Yeah. I will not have my Christmas further ruined by yeah. your you picking me a takeaway. <laughs> A red hot goat curry expected. Can you just double check that we're recording? We are recording. Definitely and recording. Yeah. I, Excellent. Don't ask me too often because I would hate to listen to it back and realise there's some little audio gremlin. Your mic is on, right? My mic is on. Yeah. Yep. It is glowing blue. It is definitely this mic that is coming through. Okay. That means enemies are nearby. <laughs> <laughs> It's been a long time since we talked about Dickens on the podcast. It was last year, in fact, when we did the Pickwick Papers with Stephen Jarvis. During that interview, we discussed Dickens' uh, sudden rise to fame and the phenomenal popularity of his first novel. The Pickwick Papers was written in the manner long associated with Dickens. It was serialised, writing episodically week in, week out. By contrast, the novella A Christmas Carol was published in one go and written in about six weeks in the latter half of 1843, published in December by Chapman and Hall. Dickens was used to writing at speed, and the carol, as he referred to it, was no exception. In the words of one of his biographers, Michael Slater, he worked on the novella at a white heat. Dickens himself described composing the novel in his head, as he wept and laughed and wept again, and excited himself in a most extraordinary manner, as he walked about the black streets of London, fifteen and twenty miles, many a night, when all the sober folks had gone to bed. Like the Pickwick Papers, A Christmas Carol would become a colossal success, eventually overtaking the former as one of Dickens's uh, most lasting works. Characters like Tiny Tim, Jacob Marley, and of course Ebenezer Scrooge have become iconic, Scrooge even entering the dictionary as the epitome of a mean and miserly person. A popular tradition has it that Dickens took the name from a tombstone here in Edinburgh, a story that might prick up the ears of Harry Potter fans. J.K. Rowling, of course, is known to have taken names from Greyfriars Kirkyard. The name Dickens supposedly found was that of Ebenezer Lennox Scroggy, whose occupation the tombstone listed as a mealman, which Dickens misread as a mean man. There's not much to back this story up, but it's an anecdote that's hard to forget during the climax of A Christmas Carol, as Scrooge is confronted by his own gravestone. With Scroggy in mind, we can imagine an alternative ending concerning mistaken identity or a chiseler's typo. Scroggy became Scrooge, so the story goes, by the combination of the words screw and gouge. But Dickens also grew up near a tradesman's called Googe and Marnie. Contenders for the inspiration for Scrooge's character include Thomas Carlyle, the Gloucester miser Jeremy Wood, and the MP for Berkshire, John Elwes. Elwes was a notorious skinflint, who despite receiving an inheritance worth millions in today's money, was rumoured to be so biblically tight that he stole a rotten moorhen out of a rat's mouth to avoid paying for his own supper. Wealth hoarders like Elwes angered Dickens. By 1843 he was determined to put his writing talents to a good cause, in particular, he wished to strike a sledgehammer blow on behalf of impoverished children. In the so-called Hungry Forties, Britain had a series of failed harvests, and with an increasing population, many starved. Dickens and like-minded observers thought it a national disgrace that a country supposedly among the most prosperous in the world was supported by life-threatening child labour and dismal living conditions for the poor. A horrified commentator from 1849 reported sewers emptying into a ditch which was some people's only source of drinking water on a London street. The water he described resembled strong green tea at first, and later mud. When Charles was young, the Dickens family had spent hard, unhappy years living in Camden, home in A Christmas Carol to the Cratchit family. John Dickens famously landed himself in a debtor's prison, meaning that the 12-year-old Charles had to work in a factory to provide for the family. Though he was now a well-known writer, with works like Pickwick, Oliver Twist and Nicholas Nickleby under his belt, by 1843 Dickens was running short of money. The reason was that his ongoing serialised novel, Martin Chuzzlewit, wasn't selling well, and his recent travel book, American Notes, had angered readers overseas. According to Lucinda Hawksley, although Dickens had written many favourable things in his travelogue, his wry jokes and outright criticisms, in particular of slavery, which was still legal in the USA at that date, made many of his former fans turn against him. He would eventually win a lot of them back with this little scheme he had brewing, but A Christmas Carol's initial domestic performance was bleak. His publishers, Chapman and Hall, with whom he was having an increasingly frosty relationship, made little effort in publicising A Christmas Carol to the extreme frustration of Dickens. To make matters worse, the printing uh, he had picked out for his novella, accompanied by John Leach's illustrations, was enormously expensive, and according to biographer Claire Tomlin, the accounts for the carol show that almost all the profits were absorbed into the expenses of binding, special paper, coloured plates and advertising. Gradually, of course, the book would go on to become one of Dickens' most lasting hits 
and is one of the most recognisable and adapted stories of all time. When do you first remember experiencing Christmas Carol in any medium? Any medium. I know you're going to talk about you know what <laughs> You know what I'm going to say. The Muppets Christmas Carol, the finest piece of Christmas Carol, mm. potentially the best Dickens adaptation, definitely the best piece of Christmas Carol media. I've learned some new Muppets Christmas Carol trivia Great. since I last talked about it. Um, Michael Caine mm. told the director he would not participate in the production if he was not allowed to play it as if he was doing Christmas Carol for the Royal Shakespeare Company, in his words. <laughs> so basically he's saying he's going to play it completely straight yeah. as an, as if he's not in a comedy adaptation. And I think that's incredible. It's also the making of the film because we need you need him to not be a Muppet as well. Yeah. You want it to feel like the Muppets have infiltrated Christmas Carol. Well, because it's... um, Gonzo is is charles dickens yeah in that adaptation it's he, he's it's, he's telling the story as mm. it happens out of his own brain and i just like the idea that michael Caine said that he is going to play this the most seriously he anyone has ever played scrooge and that is i mean when he's playing straight man against kermit the frog mm. then oh, it's great anyway that was my first christmas carol experience mm. I think I think people come out of the womb with a basic understanding of the Christmas Carol premise. True. Do you have a, a point that you can remember as your first Christmas Carol exposure? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the George C. Scott film. I've never seen it. Oh, mate. Is it as good as Muppet's Christmas Carol? I, I'm almost fearful to admit to you that I don't know if I've seen Muppet Christmas Carol. I can't believe it. I, I cannot believe you've not seen the Muppet's version of Christmas I've Carol. Seen, it is the best one. Yeah, yeah. I've seen bits of it and I've... For, in that horrible phrase but i don't think i've actually seen it beginning to end that's your christmas plan sorted then okay and you watch the george c scott one and i would watch the george c scott one and i guarantee you'll have a better time probably will yeah no it, <laughs> it is a great film the george c scott one but it's, oh, it's straight no doubt. like it's 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 not got much muppetry in it um see that's the thing i think because everybody knows just how the story goes I don't know how much merit I personally find in a completely straight adaptation of The Christmas Carol. Yeah, but you know how some feel like, some adaptations often feel like the one where they got it right. Sure. It has that sort of Okay, feel. I will I mean, definitely give it a go. Maybe biased as it being the first one. I mean, it's an American and, in the lead yeah. role. It seems all wrong. And, yet... and Kermit the Frog is not in it, <laughs> even once. No, he's in the background. He's, uh, okay, he's cool. just knocking That's around. Okay, <laughs> Blackadder Christmas Carol, that was another early... The Blackadder Christmas Carol is very good. It is, yeah. Almost as good as ours. Almost as good as ours. But like I said, I think it's got merit because it's... You can play with people's expectations because you can 100% guarantee that anybody watching it already knows how it's supposed to go. Mm. So you, it's not like you're telling an original story. You can have someone's... In the head, someone's waiting for these plot beats to be hit. Mm -hmm. And you can tease them with it or you can hit them with it out of the blue. Like, I, you, you say you've seen bits of Muppet's Christmas Carol. Mm. Do you remember the uh, Christmas yet to come? Do you know what he looks like? No. Okay, then I won't spoil it for you. Mm. But it is terrifying. Mm. <laughs> it's horrific. But you don't expect it to go to the place that it goes mm. because it's the Muppets version. Mm. You have the benefit of being able to play with a story that everybody knows back to front. And then in that horrible turn of phrase, subvert expectations. Mm. Which isn't always a good thing, but I think it works in this one because you've got, it's a compact story that has a very defined beginning, a middle and an end. I think I saw someone do a three panel retelling of Christmas Carol. And I think it starts off with Scrooge telling Bob Cratchit, he sucks. And then the middle panel is three ghosts telling him that he sucks. And then the last panel is Scrooge saying he loves Christmas. <laughs> you know yeah fill in the details in between but that is that is christmas carol it's those it is a three-act structure in the most classical way mm. it's scrooge is a bastard the three ghosts and then scrooge is redeemed from his scrooginess how redeemed do you think he is because it's hard not to read it happens so quickly and it also happens with so much i don't know slightly drier sides from scrooge which i'd forgotten uh, since the last time I read it, which was probably last year, preparing for the failed episode of ours. But I love the way that he tries to game them a bit. He says things <laughs> like when <laughs> when Jacob Marley says, you will be visited by three ghosts. I'd forgotten that he says, 
and and one of them was going to come at 1 a.m etc etc yeah. i'd forgotten that scrooge his first res- response is oh couldn't i take them all at once and just have it over with <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, I think, I don't know how original Scrooge is a character compared to what was being written around the time. Like, the context for a Victorian Christmas mm. is not our Christmas. Yeah, and it had only recently come back. Become, yeah. Um, and it was, a, it was a growing movement when he wrote the Christmas Carol. Well, he's, he's right up there with um, the invention of Christmas cards, mm. developing this culture around Christmas. Have you ever seen the original Christmas cards? I think I have actually in a book about Dickens. And they are fucking nuts. Yeah. Like they did not quite have it down as what was supposed to go on a greetings card. So you just have this nightmarish imagery. There's like a man who's a turnip. I remember one that's two frogs dueling to the death with swords. Where it's just they they hadn't great. invented they hadn't invented Christmas. There's one I saw that was a dead robin. Mm. And I read up on I read up on why there was a dead robin and that signified basically you were sending somebody a card with a dead robin on it because that robin signified all of the people without homes who were going to die out in the cold mm. and you should be grateful that you haven't died this year perfect card for exposure. this year really a dead robin yeah, yeah. In 1835, Dickens had written A Christmas Dinner, a short story that was collected in his sketches by Boz, which was a sign of things to come, as after the carol he would make a tradition of writing Christmas novellas. Christmas as we now celebrate it was in its infancy. At the beginning of Dickens' lifetime, the major winter celebration was still Twelfth Night. Here in Scotland, they were even slower to warm to Christmas, the chief Scottish celebration being Hogmanay, New Year's Eve. Christmas only became a public holiday as recently as 1958. Long gone were the days of yuletide festivities evidenced in medieval poems like Gawain and the Green Knight, but at the beginning of the 19th century there was a Christmas revival documented in a book of illustrations by a former Dickens collaborator, Robert Seymour. In the Book of Christmas he depicted traditions old and newfound, from houses decked in greenery to a Christmas pantomime. One illustration shows a crafty bearded figure called Old Christmas riding a goat. The illustrations are an interesting blend of piety and bacchanalian feasting, Christmas's future and past, a blend that is displayed in A Christmas Carol. According to G.K. Chesterton, Dickens was fighting for the old European festival, pagan and Christian, for that trinity of eating, drinking and praying, and for the character of Christmas that lies chiefly in two things, first on the terrestrial side the note of comfort rather than the note of brightness, and on the spiritual side Christian charity rather than Christian ecstasy. Comfort is, Chesterton writes, like charity, a very English instinct. The popularising of Christmas in the Western world had been developing before Dickens. As Lucinda Hawksley points out, Clement Clarke's poem, A Visit from St Nicholas, better known today as Twas the Night Before Christmas, was published in America in 1822, when Dickens was ten. And he would also have read the Christmas works of writers like Washington Irving. But more than any other author, it was Dickens that was destined to become the most associated with Christmas. He ignited a craze for Christmas story writing, which prompted William Makepeace Thackeray, who was actually a fan of A Christmas Carol, to nevertheless write an article in 1847 called A Grumble About the Christmas Books. The same year that A Christmas Carol was published, 1843, the first commercial Christmas card was produced also. By the end of his life, the author was so closely bound up with all things Christmas that upon hearing Dickens had died, a Drury Lane Barrow girl is supposed to have cried out, Dickens is dead? Then will Father Christmas die too? There's so many sort of cinematic bits. I know it's obviously one of the most adapted stories ever, but there are so many bits that seem made for film, like yeah. the way that they he just steps through the room and it becomes the past. It's very there's bits yeah, that it's feel very visual. like panning shots. Yeah, um, from what I remember of the last time reading it, it well you can tell that Dickens writes these stories with the intention to read them aloud, mm. as he was wont to do. Yeah, you know, he made a lot of his money from speaking engagements. Mm. So to make it engaging, there's a lot of a lot of talk of movement and things he could do with his hands. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm 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 not at all surprised that it reads like that. in an age where the closest thing you would get to a film would be Dickens standing on the stage and telling ghost stories. Yeah, 
And feasibly, this is one of his novels that he could read in a night. Like it could yeah. be a night's entertainment. As a, you know. Oh, definitely. You could probably read that in a couple of hours. Couldn't do that. Allowed. Pickwick Papers. Oh, yeah. Uh, seven months <laughs> on stage. A Christmas Carol's narrator has a playful, mischievous, almost gossipy tone of voice. Described by Harold Bloom as magnificently vivid and carrying an undersong of what we frequently value in children's literature and in early romance. A closeness to origins by which we find our way back to a primal exuberance. Dickens had youthful aspirations to be an actor-writer in the style of his hero, Shakespeare. And despite his success as a novelist, it was an itch he continued to scratch at. He wrote and performed plays and delighted in giving readings of his works, events that were popular throughout his lifetime. He was still performing when so weakened by a series of strokes that he couldn't articulate the name Pickwick, instead referring to his famous character as Picksnick, Picknick and Peckwicks. His final performance was given in the year of his death, March the 15th, 1870, at London's St James Hall. 2,000 people gathered to hear the great author read his favourite text to perform, which was A Christmas Carol. Bloom says that the performances were also popular because Dickens put so much physical energy into the readings. Many reports exist revealing how he made happy smacking sounds as he pretended to taste the apple sauce at the feast, and how he used a knife and his fingers to illustrate Mr Fezziwig's famous dancing trick. After one of his readings, he remarked, the town was drunk with the carol far into the night. Intoxicating as it might have been, one thing the carol loses in performance is the interplay between a narrator invisible to the reader and ghosts. The narrator of the carol seems at times to be speaking to us from the same spectral dimension that Scrooge's visitors hail from. When the ghost of Christmas past approaches Scrooge, the narrator says it came as close as I am now to you, and I am standing in the spirit at your elbow. This sounds rather like the unsettling information Jacob Marley has just told his old partner, that he has sat invisible beside you many and many a day. And this isn't the only time Dickens plays with invisible presences. On Christmas Eve night, the clerk Bob Cratchit is hurrying home to play blind man's bluff with his family, little knowing that he will be visited by two more persons he won't be able to see, with or without a blindfold. What do you think of the moral of, of Christmas Carol, and how genuine do you think it is? Because it seems like we're being asked to question um, mm-hmm. whether Scrooge is actually changing his... Because uh, it's a bit like Pascal's wager, isn't it? Um, he's shown all of this awful stuff that will happen. He's shown that he's going to die, crucially. Um, Does he start believing in Christmas because he doesn't want to die or because he genuinely has a change of heart? Um, I'm going to say about 50-50 on that one because that's very much a religious vibe anyway, is people only doing good because they're afraid of punishment from God. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think think as as far as writing from that period goes, I would say that is as much of a a personal redemptive story as one could expect. Mm. So I would assume that that is off the end of Christmas Carol, Scrooge goes on with his life. I assume that is him redeemed. He doesn't just become Scrooge again by next Christmas. Yeah. I believe. It would be quite funny though, wouldn't it? Christmas Carol too. Back to his old tricks. (laughs) (laughs) It is interesting to wonder about the exact moment of Scrooge's conversion. Although moved enough by the apparition of Marley to hear him out, he is not yet a saved man. Though unable to humbug away the spectacle of Marley, Scrooge is still a hard man to influence. As the narrator says, no warmth could warm, no wintry weather chill him. Told he will be visited by three spirits in a row, something of the hard-headed businessman comes out as Scrooge asks, couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? So when does the worm turn? And when it does, is Scrooge's conversion self-interested or in earnest? The three ghosts, past, present and future, come at Scrooge on three fronts. The first shows him what he has lost or forgotten, the second shows him what he ignores in his own world, and the third shows him what will happen if he doesn't change his ways. The ghost of Christmas past shows him in happier times, as a young apprentice dancing with the Mr and Mrs Fezziwig, the latter described as a vast, substantial smile. Already we are worlds away from Scrooge having a melancholy dinner in a melancholy tavern. Before we get to the Fezziwigs, Scrooge has shown himself as a child, neglected and alone until rescued by his sister, particularly heart-wrenching for Scrooge, as little Fan has since died. Barbara Hardy suggests that here the link is made with old affection and old sorrow. Scrooge feels pity for his former self, and the pity brings with it the first movement of imaginative self-criticism. The spectacle shakes him out of his wits, and already he is wishing he could have shown more kindness to Bob Cratchit and the carolers he humbugged off the night before. In classical style, each of the ghosts' arguments build on the last. 
After the ghost of Christmas past leaves, Scrooge might have descended into nothing more than self-pity, remembering times past and wishing that he'd done things differently. The ghost of Christmas present takes the focus away from Scrooge and shows him the plight of others. He is shown the Cratchit family and is particularly moved by Bob's crippled son, Tiny Tim. Scrooge is also spirited out of London and shown Christmases celebrated by miners and sailors, even two weather-beaten men singing over a can of grog in a lighthouse built on a dismal reef of sunken rocks. These are lives Scrooge has clearly never thought of, even despite all his brutal talk of surplus populations. As the spirit says, oh God, to hear the insect on the leaf pronouncing on the too much life among his hungry brothers in the dust. The climax of this second visit comes with the now aging spirit, revealing the two children ignorance and want, named like characters from a morality play and seeming more like creatures than human beings. When Scrooge sees something protruding from the spirit's skirts, he wonders if it is a foot or a claw. It might be a claw for the flesh there is upon it, replies the spirit. Sickened and pitying them, Scrooge has his famous words thrown back in his face. Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? But it should be noted that when Scrooge looks at the face of ignorance and want, he sees where angels might have sat enthroned, devils lurked and glared out menacing. The scene clearly affects Scrooge greatly. It is a pivotal moment and represents that sledgehammer blow Dickens was so keen to strike. And yet we still have reason to ask, is Scrooge's conversion motivated by genuine sorrow and disgrace, or does he feel under threat? We began this series of podcasts talking about The Time Machine, written at the end of Dickens' century, which also dramatises the glaring menace of an uncontrolled working class. When Scrooge looks into the faces of ignorance and want, is he disgusted by his lack of charity, or shuddering at tomorrow's Morlocks? In a tale that ends by attesting that a moral life is a happy life, there is still a fair amount of ambiguity in Scrooge's motives. After all, he only swears to honour Christmas in his heart once he has been shown his grave by the final spirit. Does this sound like repentance or bargaining? Some authors have expressed cynicism at the thought of Scrooge's reform, and those include Edmund Wilson, who wrote, Unquestionably, he would relapse when the merriment was over, if not while it was still going on, into moroseness, vindictiveness, suspicion. He would reveal himself as the victim of a manic depressive cycle and a very uncomfortable person. Supporting Wilson, there is something slightly discomforting about Scrooge's choice of words post-conversion. I am quite a baby, he says in his giddiness. Never mind, I don't care. I'd rather be a baby. Hello, whoop. This sounds a bit like his newfound happiness rests on willful ignorance, choosing to live in a show of manic cheer to hold off the grave. But this is perhaps getting to be a little bit Scroogeish about Scrooge. It doesn't seem particularly likely that Dickens intended his lead character's escape from death to be down to feigned jollity and cunning. And there are alternative ways of reading preferring to be a baby. Perhaps a miserable childhood and the loss of his sister, what little fan, has deadened him to the adult world. It is enough for a man to understand his own business and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly, Scrooge says towards the start of the book. It sounds as if there is something unexamined and automatic in his character, that he might be a miser out of habit. As a younger man, he doesn't appear to recognise the truth in what his fiancée tells him, that she has seen his nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses him. It's worth pointing out that Dickens' inspiration for Tiny Tim was his own nephew, Henry, who, like Tim, was disabled. His mother, Dickens' sister, was like Scrooge's sister, also called Fanny. Tragically, like her counterpart in A Christmas Carol, Francis Dickens died too, five years after the novella was published, and Henry, unlike his counterpart, died also. These tragedies were yet to come, though Dickens had already lost one sister, and there is a theme of lost children and childhoods in A Christmas Carol. Scrooge himself is something of a lost child. We get a sense of this in the description of his living quarters, in a lowering pile of building up a yard, where it had so little business to be that one could scarcely help fancying it must have run there when it was a young house, playing at hide-and-seek with other houses, and forgotten the way out again. So who is who's sending these ghosts? Is it God or is it Satan? Because he sent someone sent Marley, who is, I guess, in hell, to tell Scrooge, you're going to end up like this if you don't stop being such a bastard. Mm. You know, who, who gives enough of a shit about Scrooge to actually send all these ghosts? Well, I always got the impression that Jacob Marley was shortening this period of chain-dragging penitence mm -hmm. by doing a good deed and helping Scrooge. Interesting. I just, I just got the impression that it's have have you read have you read the fables the Aesop's fables? Oh yeah. There's a very fabulistic quality to these stories. Mm. 
in the sense that it is very much a action reaction kind of story. Mm-hmm. Scrooge, you are a Scrooge. Change or you'll go to hell. It could almost be an Aesop's fable. A man is visited by a ghost who tells him you'll end up like me if you don't change your ways. You know, it's yeah. a simple enough framework. Yeah. But then they Again, hang a lot it of... Brings us, yeah. It brings us to this problem of like, are they doing it out of goodness or doing it in order to cut themselves a deal? You know? Mm. Like, is Marley helping Scrooge because Marley has any agency? Well, because Marley... he's been yeah. sent to, you know, uh, perform penance then he's just been sent to warn Scrooge and he's just doing it because he's been told to. The other three ghosts aren't people. They seem like primal forces almost. Mm. You know, they're like... Have you read Terry Pratchett? Not as much as you have. I I have read an embarrassingly large amount of Terry Pratchett. Mm. But he has a concept with gods, which is very similar to this, in the sense that you've got the big gods and you've got the small gods. And the small gods are the gods of very small things. Like, Mm. there's a god, one of the main characters in one of his books is the god of things that get stuck in the cutlery drawer when you try to pull it open and you can't pull it open because there's something stuck in the cutlery drawer. Like, Mm. there's a god of that. And every time that happens to somebody, that god gets a bit more powerful. Mm. And all these gods' powers are based on active belief. And these ghosts feel like they are their own small gods of this time of year. You know, this is the god of Christmas past, you know, almost God is almost more appropriate than ghost because ghost applies, implies that these are people who were alive and died, but they seem like omnipotence. Dickens creates a whole invisible world for this short novel. In the lore of A Christmas Carol, spirits are condemned to labour and wander the world, unseen by those they didn't help in life. In the extraordinary moment in which Scrooge looks through the window Jacob Marley has just floated out of, he sees that the air was filled with phantoms. He even recognises one old ghost in a white waistcoat, with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman with an infant. It is a wonderful Dickensian contradiction to have these phantoms weighed down with chains and iron safe boxes, and yet floating through the air, weightless in the physical world. The three spirits that follow are uniquely designed, and the ghost of Christmas past is perhaps the strangest, also full of contradictions. An androgynous figure, seemingly at once old and young, decorated with both holly and summer flowers. Most arresting of all is the jet of light streaming out of the spirit's crown. Scrooge recoils from this and begs the spirit to extinguish it by putting on his cap, but the light cannot be dimmed, just as the past cannot be changed. The spirit is quiet but commanding, and at one point, in a most unethereal way, pinioning Scrooge's arms to force him to watch what happens next. According to Malcolm Andrews, the ghost of Christmas past by constantly metamorphosing has come to disturb Scrooge into a recognition, first painful, then joyous, of his true multifaceted self. Surrogate father, uncle, child, businessman, pledged to live in the past, the present, and the future. The next ghost, Christmas Present, somewhat resembles Robert Seymour's illustration for Old Christmas, minus the goat. He appears in the adjoining room to Scrooge, which has been transformed into a perfect grove of living green. Anything but spectral, the spirit is the picture of heartiness and health. Scrooge is described as looking upon him with reverence. Like the Green Knight from the medieval poem, his anticipated supernatural threat is offset by his being surprisingly handsome. He flaunts a capacious breast in a loose-fitting fur-lined robe. And on the subject of that um, poem, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, we see at uh, King Arthur's court in Camelot that his courtiers are caroling and also playing a New Year's game of giving gifts. Those who fail to guess their gifts would be uh, forced to perform a forfeit, usually giving a kiss. There is a reference to a similar forfeit game going on at Fezziwig's party. As for caroling, which also goes on at King Arthur's court, well, carols were originally um, associated with round dances. They were sung by pagans as they danced round stones. And the caroling in, a, in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is, prefigures the circularity of the whole story, beginning at Christmas time and New Year's and traveling through a year throughout all the seasons arriving at the same time of year as there is a similar circularity in a in a christmas carol scrooge doesn't travel through a a a whole calendar year but he meets the same characters as a as a transformed man just as 
Gawain is transformed by his uh, his challenge in the poem. Dickens clearly wanted to make a reference to the musical form of a carol. It is organised not in chapters, but staves. Stave one, uh, two, three, four and five. But anyway, the third spirit, whilst often in adaptations the most chilling, is more traditional, a hooded figure like the conventional spectre of death. Dickens, in one of his smoothest cinematic transitions, disappears the third spirit by having the hooded dress shrink, collapse and dwindle down into a bedpost. There is something ghoulish about that bedpost, as if Dickens knows full well we've all been wondering what's under the cloak, and instead of showing us, leaves us with a lasting comparison to something hard and bony. One of the things I love about the ending of A Christmas Carol is the way in which Scrooge is bestowed with a spiritual or supernatural power. It's his own little gift for going through what he's been through, and he returns to his day-to-day life with the advantages of a time traveller. He plays with people's expectations of him, most memorably by feigning to be angry at Bob Cratchit before giving him a raise. Since the last time they saw each other, Scrooge has been to the past, the future, and been invisibly present in Bob's own home. So it is a lovely little touch that when the clerk comes running in late to work, he does so as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Moneylender is very typically a sort of Jewish stereotype. Yeah. When you've got your Shylocks because of the way the church handled money lending. Money lending is a sin in the eyes of the Catholic Church. And basically the only people who ended up being money lenders were the Jews because they weren't allowed to have any other jobs under Catholic law. So mm. you end up which is it's all, all kinds of messed up, but it's the root of a lot of anti Semitic stereotyping. Yeah. Basically, it makes it really easy if you're rich to not have to pay back your money lender if you can just execute them or, ex- or exile them yeah. for being insidious Jews. Mm. But I think that is, that is being a money lender, especially in literature post Shylock, is a very loaded profession. Where if someone is, you're not going to have, a, you're not going to cast somebody as a heroic money lender. You know, it's not an yeah. You know, what I mean, it's, idea, it's not <laughs> yeah. It's 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 not an evil job mm. in the same way that being a pawnbroker isn't an evil job. It's like, you know, old curiosity shop style. Mm. You know, being a pawnbroker yourself is not evil, but you prey on people in negative, poor circumstances. Nobody who's in a good place is coming to you for a loan. Just a quick point on the Jewish and Christian references. As Terry W. Thompson has said, Scrooge's living quarters are described in minute detail, and among these details is a fleeting but illuminative allusion to the Old Testament figure of King Belshazzar. Belshazzar was a Babylonian king who in the book of Daniel is terrified by the vision of a hand writing on the wall. Daniel interprets the writing and tells Belshazzar that because he has turned his back on God, his kingdom will be taken from him. Jane Vogel points out that the Christ-like figure of Tiny Tim is like a shining star set upon the Christmas tree, who Dickens uses to show that gloomy men like Marley and Scrooge are Christians in name only. Vogel goes on to say that Ebenezer is the name of the stone set by Samuel, judge of Israel, to commemorate a Hebrew victory over foes. Ebenezer means, hitherto hath the Lord helped us. Ebenezer is a stone, and stony-hearted Ebenezer lives up to his name. His moral crime is essentially being mean to Bob Cratchit which he is then redeemed by stopping being mean to Bob Cratchit. Bob Cratchit is an interesting character. Let's talk a bit about Bob. You've played Bob Cratchit, of course, so you have a I unique have insight to the man. <laughs> yeah, I played him, played a method. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's um, not much of a character in terms of characterization. He's characterized by his relations to other characters. He has a, he's a love, he's a dutiful father with a sick son and a boss. He, he doesn't hate his boss. No, he defends his boss at the dinner table from his yep. much more straight shooting wife. Who, um, you know, his wife is completely right when she's talking mm-hmm. about Scrooge. Whereas Scrooge is a bastard who takes advantage of you yep. and belittles you and makes you work on Christmas Day. Oh, no, and he just about lets you go. Just on Christmas about Day, gives him a day lets off. you get there even earlier on Boxing Day. And no, and bob stands up for him it, it's almost as if the impression the impression i get is that bob may have worked for him before he was such a scrooge there's echoes of the kind of um stupid master clever servant mm. archetypes in these two characters in the sense that bob is the emotionally and morally developed character yeah you were on bob's side from the start but yet he is under the thumb of this scrooge should we talk a bit about tiny tim another character you've played um tiny tim is always just bob cratchit but um 
pitched up pitched a bit higher yeah <laughs> like um in 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 muppet's christmas cow he's literally played by a smaller version of kermit but, um, yeah that's the route we took tiny tim is innocence personified he he's he's the undeserving suffering mm. personified you know he is a child born sick in a world that has absolutely no time for sick children or is it is it consumption he has or is it just like waif disease it's just, in the book it's just described as cripple but he he coughs he also coughs yeah he's a very sickly child who walks yeah. with a cane and god love him he's tiny tim and he says god bless us everyone yeah and everyone melts. voice of an angel loves singing hymns he loves oh he loves to praise god and when he dies it is the death of innocence is scrooge even aware of tiny tim before he has shown bob cratchit's house i think he is he's i don't think he is in the book okay well i'm going off the Muppets christmas carol <laughs> um he's when he, he he looks through the window and he says that's tiny tim not in not knowing potentially if he's ever met him or not mm. but he is aware that bob cratchit has well it's um you know he should just die and reduce the surplus population. Yeah, of course. But that's something he says about the sick and the needy. It's not mm -hmm. something he says about Tiny Tim. It's something in the no, book but that, that's, that's thrown yeah. in his face when he does see yeah. Tiny Tim. And, he, and yeah, Tiny Tim is like the yeah. face on the faceless mass of sick kids that he's previously yeah. lambasted. But So that's that was that was a very in vogue argument. In in the same way that now you know, that's kind of like people talking about herd mentality for COVID, where they're just like, oh, just some people will die, but it's for the greater good. Yeah. It's yeah. almost sort of like proto-Darwinian idea of survival. Well, it's brushing against the sort of dark side of eugenics. and Yeah, where you just, yeah. if you're sick and a, if you're a sickly child, we're all expending valuable resources keeping you alive. And then that is, Scrooge has never, because he's a Scrooge and a complete misanthrope, never has actually had to confront i guess he doesn't even do his own collection you yeah. know his money collection he never has to confront the face of you're right he's the face of these people who he's very flippantly glibly condemned mm. without actually thinking of them as individual human lives yeah which i think is the beginning of his transformation and those valuable resources would otherwise be going into a christmas dinner for one <laughs> yeah but he um not even a christmas dinner he would just you know go to bed and yeah. wake up the next day count his money oh, the, oh uh what's his name his nephew fred fred yeah th that's another very hard-hitting scene is when they're playing the party game you know that's that, that's another great insecurity you know who's going to remember me after i die and are people making fun of me behind my back yeah you know being get, giving a, getting a glimpse into a group of people having enormous expense at how awful a person you are yeah is another i think personality shifting event i also think that's another fascinating like complicating factor because when he turns up to the party once he's had his conversion mm -hmm. he, he he's had a unique insight he's had supernatural yeah. um insight into what they'd be doing without him and he does sort of enter with a sort of sense of fame like if screwed yeah like if he he's just, like um if yeah. he just he's like had Biff a in back to the future with a sports almanac you know he he's knowing when he turns up I, this is one of the reasons i love the george c scott version because he recognizes them all and he shows that he does just with his sort of facial acting um yeah Obviously, they've never seen him before. They've just heard Fred's stories of his grumpy old, yeah. miserable bust uncle. of an uncle. Um, Why, it's Uncle Scrooge! Yeah, exactly. Whereas uh, yeah. Scrooge himself is is sort of looking around like, yeah, sort of saw you having a good laugh at my expense oh, the other day. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that's definitely the right way to do the resolution of that scene. Mm. You know, that is definitely, a, that's a different man who walks into that than the one you introduced to at the beginning. Yeah. I, don't know. I think that's a. I think that is a great scene because it's the first time, potentially the only time in the story where you're actually on Scrooge's side in any meaningful way. Yeah, and he also becomes he he's, he becomes the supernatural element as well. Yeah, like, I like that. Uh, we cotton on quicker than he does to how the ghosts are going to work. You know, he he yeah. necessarily 
is slow or it's very cleverly done like you know when they're talking about the clothes um yeah. what he says i don't have them to hand but his his comments about who the hell is this that they're talking about they could be read two ways they could be like <laughs> scrooge is doing a bit of a harry potter you know being much slower than the plot in order yeah. to you know explain stuff or he is in denial he knows exactly who it is straight away because I think it's yeah. How have the other ghosts gone? They're showing you stuff about you, you idiot. So who do you think you do? You think you're seeing a random yeah. dead guy? No. Um, no, yeah, I think it's very much. Uh, but it's it's got such a light touch that scene for all of its morbidity. It's the necessary part of his character development to be mm. humiliated. Basically, I think it is the next. It, in order to change a character from being an asshole to being redeemed you have to break down the man you've got to take away his dignity in order to restore yeah. it different and so you are making fun of every part of him as a character you know scrooge people don't see you as a, a powerful businessman or whatever you want to be seen as if you even care they see you as a joke yeah. and that's an important part of his development in his chain that's the other thing that's a bit of, of a mystery about scrooge is he's not um i know people have done this like it's easy to draw a line be between um how scrooge has often been represented and someone like a donald trump for example who's like a miser and a rich man who doesn't give a shit about the poor blah 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 blah. but scrooge actually isn't yeah. like that in the sense that he doesn't seem to have thought at all about what people think about him Yes, like he's so obsessed with money and gold, he's not even thinking about yeah. it. Yeah, but even his his money, like we are told, he's obsessed with money. We are told by his um, love interest, and we are told by you know Jacob Marley. But he, it's not as if we get some kind of Scrooge McDuck fantasia of Scrooge diving into. I was gold. about yeah, <laughs> you know. I was about to say the natural the natural cartoonishness. Mm. Like if you amp up the cartoonishness of Scrooge, you get a duck diving into a a safe a giant vault full of coins yeah, but you know? i don't know if that's actually there i think it's almost like a an addiction he's not even really aware of like he just doing he he just seems to have become so warped and um miserable that he's just doing this out of doing the motions and maybe he has a stubborn pride in being comfortable but he's certainly not enjoying yeah. his riches either in spending stuff on himself or by you know g g um slavering over how much he's accumulated Dickens, as I have said, was a devout Shakespeare fan and shared the playwright's love of quibbling. The mischievous opening line to the novella is Marley was dead to begin with. That soon gives way to a bit of riffing on the adage dead as a doornail. And as the narrator says he doesn't know what is particularly dead about doornails, he is already lifting up the floorboards on what he has just said about the doubtlessness of Marley being dead as well. Even Scrooge shows an unlikely taste for quibbling when convinced that the apparition of the not particularly dead Marley is the result of indigestion playing tricks on him. He says there is more of gravy than the grave about you, whatever you are. Like his hero, Shakespeare's popularity gave way to piracy. Almost as soon as Christmas Carol was released, pirated versions were being distributed, further affecting the author's slender profit margins. The piracy was so brazen that Dickens was even able to buy himself a copy in Drury Lane. But he soon set to work shutting them down, writing in a letter from 18th of January, The pirates are beaten flat. They are bruised, bloody, battered, smashed, squelched, and utterly undone. Anything else on Christmas Carol? By the way, there's a bit more banging. I'm not sure if you're talking Oh, that was, that was me, just Mike's fidgeting. Down. Just fidgeting away. Just fidgeting away. <laughs> Just, um, no, it is brief. It is very of the season. It is rightfully deserved place as a Christmas classic. Yeah. And is essentially the basis for most Christmas redemption stories, which are now pretty much their own genre. It's a bit of a masterclass in tight writing. I'm amazed it was a six week. Do you think that was a Dickens? Job. Do you think that was a lie to boost his profile? Possibly, but it it sounds like the times were that desperate that it couldn't have been any other way. Because mm -hmm. I, I don't think it was him that propagated the story. Although having okay. said that, I immediately think it was his, actually his publisher, which makes even more sense that it would have been a story. Either way, I can I can imagine it being banged out pretty quick. Um, even though it has the kind of tightness and unity that other writers would strive for and refine. I think about Chandler saying something like, I have to write 20,000 words in order to write 100 something um, like that whatever, yeah. he, whatever he said you know dickens was good the first time around although um funnily enough you know the last the sign-off line and 
Tiny Tim did not die. That was apparently added after, like, during printing. Oh. It wasn't Dickens's. Oh, so Tiny Tim did actually fucking die at the I end. I think maybe of he did Carol. die. Yeah, yeah. Or Dickens forgot to write him in in mm. the future. Interesting. Maybe he just didn't think he was that important. <laughs> All right. Well, um, God, God bless us, everyone. Unless yeah. Apart from Tiny Tim, he's dead. And apart from Tiny Tim, he's dead. Well, yeah, and that brings us to the end of Airy This for 2020. Well, we Where finally did it. We finally did recorded it. it. We finally managed to get a discussion about Christmas Carol on tape. Don't jinx it. I'm a bit worried about your mic banging. <laughs> <laughs> it's just going to be my side of this conversation all the way through. I only banged it a couple of times. <laughs>